F.W. Borum tells the story of a time that he was uh, a minister in uh, Mosgiel in New Zealand. And as he was about to prepare for a picnic, he noticed a very anxious woman outside his home. And he finally went out and she said, may I talk to you, sir? And he said, yes. She said, are you a minister? He said, yes. She said, I've heard of your name. She said, I don't go to church. What is your name, sir? He said, Mr. Borum. She said, that's right. I'm looking for you. She said, I've had a baby over the last few days. The baby was born deformed and suddenly died. Will you please help bury my baby? I don't know anybody. And this brilliant essay by Borum is called A Baby's Funeral. He said, will you come in, ma'am, so I can get the particulars, name of the father, name of the street, and all of this, he filled it out. Very fidgety and very nervous, she gave him the particulars, and uh, she went away. Borum didn't enjoy the picnic. He said to his wife, something is not right with what I've heard. The woman didn't tell me everything, I think, but anyway, we'll do the funeral tomorrow. He came back home. The woman was still standing outside his home. She said, Mr. Borum, I need to talk to you. I lied. I didn't tell you the truth. The baby is illegitimate. Yes, it's horribly deformed. Half of the face is not even there. The father is not here. I live alone. But I didn't want to tell you. I just need somebody to help me. Will you still bury my baby? He said, yes. The morning will go. It was a brand new cemetery. Thunderstorms and raining. With an umbrella held by his wife, F.W. Borum held the Bible in one hand and had his arm around the woman the other and that white little casket was lowered. He said it was the first body to be laid in the cemetery. So the cemetery is a very lonely place, but lonelier when there's not even anybody else buried out there. You're the first one. He said after the service was over, I prayed with the woman and invited her to church. He said, 25 years or so have gone by since this happened. He said, the other day I was on a train journey with my district superintendent. And he asked me to accompany him. And we went from city to city to stop. I would just read and pastors would come and gather at the train station. And he would stand in the platform and encourage them. And tell them, I know things are tough. I know your churches are small. But be there. Be there for them. Be there for them when they need you. Be there for them in their heartbreaking hours. He said, I would be reading my book, but I could overhear this. Be there for them. Be there for them in their needs. He said, I shut my book and suddenly remembered a quarter of a century had gone by since the incident of the baby's funeral. But every Sunday morning when I open my eyes and I preach, I see a woman sitting in one of the pews at the back every Sunday, every prayer meeting. She's there because I helped bury her little baby. This church became her home. But just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven, of touching a hand and finding it God's, of breathing new air and finding it celestial of waking up in glory and finding it home. Your destiny is what God calls home. But then there's another thing. It's not just the metaphor of home. It is the materiality of our destiny. The materiality of our destiny. You know, I was born and raised in India. And the gospel came to India through the Apostle Thomas. There's a memorial to Thomas' martyrdom six miles away from where I was born. If you go to the state of Kerala, you will find the first church that was ever built in India. It came from the preaching of the Apostle Thomas. This is the Thomas who in John chapter 14 said to Jesus, We don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. He gave to Thomas the words of exclusivity. Thomas went to a land of 330 million deities to tell them there was one way. But after Jesus died, something absolutely fascinating happened. The women came 
and saw the empty tomb out there. And as they're walking around looking for where the body is, Mary hears a voice calling her by name. She comes back and tells Peter, who had the loudest voice with questions, but when the moment came, he was the farthest away. And the disciples gathered on that first Sunday night. And the Lord comes through into their midst. Thomas is not there. He's gone. So they go to Thomas and tell him, do you know what happened? Here's what Thomas says. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Why didn't he just say, unless I see him? What's this deal? I want to take my finger and feel the nail-pierced hands. I want to take my hand and feel his side. Thomas questioned the continuity of truth, whether this was actually the gospel he was going to believe in. And they come back, comes back that night, and Jesus appears, and he says to Thomas, Touch my hand. Reach out and touch my side. Thomas knelt down and said, Ho kurios mu, ho theos mu, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, Blessed are you, Thomas, you have believed after seeing. Think of those who are going to believe without seeing. This man went to India and had his side thrusted with a spear for proclaiming the gospel for the Lord he had seen. I want you to understand what I'm trying to say here. What I'm trying to say here is that in the materiality of our destiny, there is going to be a connection between the body that we could recognize, but a transcendence of the soulishness that gives us that individuality, but at the same time gives us that eternal sense where touch reaches the deepest depths of your longing, not just of the flesh, but of the soul. I am convinced more and more that the cross, which is the centerpiece of the gospel, is not understood by most of us because it is the eternal counter-perspective of God. And when we stand before him in his presence, for the first time we will see, touch, and feel the gospel that we have to this point only merely heard. 